Uh, good morning, everyone. We are, this is the House Health Care Committee. Uh, we're meeting on Friday, January 29th. Hard to believe it's already January 29th, but Friday, January 29th at uh, 1030 a.m. And this morning we are getting together to hear follow-up from the Department of Health around the appropriations that were made to help address uh, health disparities using the COVID or uh, CRF COVID relief fund dollars. And with us this morning is the Deputy Commissioner of Health, uh, Tracy Dolan. Uh, welcome to the House Health Care Committee. And Hi, thanks so much. I'm going to, uh, I think that's, I'll turn it over to Tracy and then we'll uh, hear her presentation and have time for some questions. We will be adjourning at uh, 1025, or 1125, pardon me, 1125. So people know that, okay? Great, thanks. So when I first got this request, it was around actually our vaccine plan um, uh, and, and equity. Um, so that was mostly what I prepared. And then I think yesterday I got the update that it was around the funding and how we distributed that. And so I've combined both but I've housed it under um, equitable uh, vaccine access, but I've got slides that talk through the funding and where it went to. So I hope that works. Yeah, that's fine, thank okay. you. Great, so I'm gonna share my screen. I'm not great at doing that. Um, oh, it says the host disabled my screen sharing. Let's see. Hi, Tracy, you should be able to share now. Okay, great. Okay, let me find my... Um, all right, and uh, just give me one minute here. Oh, it's tricky with all of the bars. You can't get at everything you think you can get at. So give me one minute. I can't quite get at everything I want to, um, which is unfortunate because I can't get in this into a mode where you can see it without notes. So I'm gonna see if there's a way I can move this bar up here. If you can just give me one moment, sorry. Sure. Sure, and I, I will be of no technical assistance, but I'm sure there may be others who <laughs> can I help. I think it's the screen on yeah. top of the orange area. You have a screen there to your left. Yeah. You see the screen, the little, go to the right. No, um, not that far, not that far. Okay. Just before the staff meeting in the orange area. The left of that, you see uh, the icon going down and then you have the little screen. I think if you click on that, that'll give you your video. Uh, so right now I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my screen and I'm in my presentation. What I can't right there, get at. Right there. Right here. Right on it. A little box on a pedestal, a little box on a stick. Oh, right. you know what? I think you're seeing something different than I'm seeing right now, possibly. Because what I've got my I've got my cursor over something called design in my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so can you see my screen right now? And does it say equitable access to vaccine? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay. What I'm trying to do, unfortunately, is to um, get this presentation without all the notes. Right. Um, but because I can't get to the upper bar because the black bar over um, supersedes it, I can't get to a proper view. And my apologies, I'm going to see if I can troubleshoot that unless anyone knows how to troubleshoot that. Tracy, if you go, if you go all the way to the bottom, all the way to the very bottom of the, the, the view here. Yeah. Bring it all, all right, go, all, go to the right, right before the volume bar. Go all the way. There's a little box mm -hmm. with a on a stick if you hit that i think it'll do what you want yeah well, unfortunately i don't see that i'm gonna let colleen take control of my screen and see if she can get me to a to a presentation that allows uh this to be the view colleen say you're in you're in the same spot that i'm in there we go thank you so much story i couldn't yep. get to it can you hear me now everyone yes we can great um all right so equitable access to vaccine, that we're, that's what we're gonna talk about today. My apologies, it's a different title. Uh, this is a presentation we used a few days ago. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, 
All right, I think maybe I, uh, I play with the next slide. Um, so why do we need specifically to have a vaccine plan for Vermonters of color? Um, racist systems impact um, health negatively. We know COVID-19 exacerbates existing health disparities. I think you probably saw in an earlier presentation to you that our COVID-19 rates among people of color in Vermont, um, the infectivity rates are at least three times higher depending on the subset of the population. So we know that we've got higher infection. Um, there's mistrust in public health and healthcare systems. Um, we have recess settled refugees when we talk about different groups, Abenaki Vermonters and other communities of color that have specific healthcare access issues. So they're not all the same issues. Sometimes it's language, sometimes it's mistrust. Um, sometimes it is uh, transportation, um, lack of under education about it, et cetera. There's a variety of uh, reasons um, and, and it, it shows up differently for different groups. And so we did receive guidance from the Social Equity Caucus, the Racial Equity Task Force and the Director of Racial Equity to learn more about what we need to do uniquely on our vaccine plan. We saw um, with our testing um, that we needed to do some things differently with contact tracing. Um, we had to do things differently. And um, so we did begin to put money out to the community to get better partnerships to understand more and work more um, in a more personal way with some of these communities to make sure we were doing things differently. And then as our vaccine plans started to develop, we realized early on we need to do something different again, um, building on those partnerships. Let me go to the next slide, there we go. So our first strategy um, was to survey the community to inform the vaccine implementation strategy. So that's what I was just talking about. Our second strategy was to compile qualitative data from community partners representing these priority populations to inform vaccine access, communication, and translation strategies. And our third was to fund trusted community partners to provide technical assistance, outreach, and support with messaging. So I'm gonna to try to move from this screen. And Colleen, I'm gonna ask, are you able to minimize so that I can open a different file so I can show how we've used the money so far? Um, what are you trying to do? I'd like to minimize this because I need to get at another file. Okay, and I sure. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry, team. I apologize. I'm going to request remote control again, if that's okay. Yeah, I thought that's what you had. Sorry. Okay, great. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully minimize this so I can get at other files. And are you able to Colleen do that for me? If not, you can give it back to me and I might be able to play with it and figure it out. Uh, yeah, it's not going to let me because at the moment you are just sharing your PowerPoint. So okay. um, so you're gonna going have to, to go back to your choice of screen shares and select another document. Okay, that's what I'll try to do now. Um, I'll go to new share, that's it, good. And um, here we go, let's see if this works, all right. Um, let's see if I can, can you see this screen? Whoops. Uh, yes. All right. I'll try again. Um, Not full screen, but we can, we can see it. You can see some of it. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, we just had it and it appears to be gone. So we'll have to, I'll just have to ask you to be patient while I find that again. So a new share. Hmm. Um, uh, what happens if I show all windows here? So it was here and I clicked on it and now it appears to have gone. Um, yeah, I'm gonna end your screen share and then maybe you can just see if yeah. it's starting over, just. Yeah, that. that'd be great. And let's see if I can um, find a exit full screen and I'll get to my document that way. Thank you, yep. Okay, all right, I have the document here. So I'll go back in and try screen share again, maybe. Maybe that's the way to go. Hmm. We're on Zoom, all right. 
me share, share screen. There we go, I see it. So I'm sorry that this is as big as I know how to get it right now. Um, I don't know if you can see it well enough, but I'll try to read it out. So these are um, the CRF awardees through December, and then I'll try to speak to um, the rest. But over the last um, probably 16 months, we've awarded $1.5 million out into the community around equity. Um, are you able to see this? I can see the first slide. Great. Of what okay. I think is a series of slides. Yeah. Has, has, this, has this document been shared with Colleen to post on our website? On our no. web page? Can that be done? No. Yeah. Do you need that right now? Uh, well, we'll follow it on the screen. If, if, yeah, if so you had it, Colleen could post it and people who had uh, their they could follow it on their own device. Okay, Colleen, depending. how would I do that right now? Hi, Colleen, how would I do that right now? Um, you can either send it directly to, email it directly to me, or you can uh, email it to Sarah Gr Gregoric. I think she's reaching out to you about um, getting them as well. Okay. I think so, it would be useful um, to have it on the screen share as well, but. Yeah, so I did just, um, there we go. I'm sending it to you now. Um, and what's your address, Colleen? C McGovern, M C G O V. C McGovern, yep. At ledge. That state. That Vermont or DVT, sorry. Dot US. Great. Dot US. Thank you. So it is C at C McGovern at ledge.state.vt.us. Good, sending it now. Okay, so I'll just walk through it. So um, the first organization is Abenaki Helping Abenaki. They were awarded 117,000. And this is a statewide reach. Um, they coordinate food security programs for the Milpegan Band of the Kosuk Abenaki people. And this funding was to provide food cards and support for the Renewable Meat Source Program and services supplemented by CRF will be available to all Abenaki Vermonters. Another organization was the Church of East Arlington, 10,000. Um, the REACH was Washington County, provided 400 community support kits to assist older adults and people with disabilities in staying healthy and safe during the COVID pandemic. Five kits would be available to provide customized support and resources for each individual. And kits included COVID-19 safety, cleaning, self-hygiene, warmth, and food insecurity. We also supported the Clemens Family Farm, 80,000. Um, this is the only Black-led 5LC3 nonprofit organization in Vermont, offering arts and culture programs led by Vermont artists of African descent. Funding supports Black and um, Bliss Wellness Art Series, includes visual virtual art sessions, distribution of wellness art kits, and survey results report on perceived outcomes of wellness. We also supported the Community Health Services of Addison County Open Door Clinic for 26,000, hiring bilingual Spanish speaking outreach assistants to support farms in providing on site testing, outreach, and education, developing a clinically accurate, contextually, and culturally specific COVID 19 public health messages, consulting with EPI as needed, and assisting the state to culturally broker care and prevention strategies related to COVID 19. We also supported um, Dr. Mercedes Avila um, through Spectrum. Spectrum is the financial agent there for 247,000. And this is the cultural brokers program providing integrated prevention, uh, education and care. We also conducted focus groups so we could understand more areas of need um, and health disparities exacerbated by COVID-19. Also provided three training sessions on cultural and ling linguistic competence to the HOC staff. The HOC is the Health Operations Center. That's the center that's running our pandemic response at the Department of Health. We provided 41,000 to the family room. Um, that's Burlington Winooski, providing emotional support and crisis prevention and intervention to immigrant and refugee families with young children, basic needs, um, including in culturally significant foods. And then the Northeast Kingdom Community Action for 55,000 providing food access to isolated communities in Essex County and older adults, facilitated online support groups for LGBTQ youth in the NEK. I think there's a hand. 
I see you. Yeah. Yes, could you, for the Northeast Kingdom, the community action, 55,000, you know how they spent it? Other than... Yeah, it's, it's what we described here. So this is increased food access, okay. um, phone and internet access, facilitated online support groups. So that last bullet is, the last couple of bullets in each column are the, the ways they were spending it. Thank you. Thank you. The One Mask Initiative, um, and that reach was the Old North End, providing quality masks to those who need them. Um, outright Vermont, 90,000 providing emotional support and care to 200 plus isolated LGBTQ youth around the state. The funding supported technology and internet access for peer support, mentoring, professional service and health and resource information. The Racial Justice Alliance for 80,000 hosts a series with community partners like Vermont Interfaith Action, Public Assets Institute, Vermont Medical Center and others. Rise Vermont, um, reducing in the Richmond Bolton area, reducing social isolation and provide, improving, I'm sorry, access to health services to older Vermonters by creating a laptop lending program. Also coordinated online activities, virtual community events, telehealth and remote gatherings with friends and family. And the Special Olympics 14,000 provided virtual biweekly athlete engagement sessions. Twin Pines Housing, it was just a $5,000 grant, training equipment and internet access for isolated seniors, also gas cards for medical appointments. United Way of Rutland County, 56,000. New partnership there, uh, facilitating outreach and engagement work of service providers in Rutland County that serve older Vermonters and people with disabilities. The sub-recipient will plan and host trainings on implicit bias for first responders, social workers, and educators. United Way of Wyndham County, 122,000, facilitating ongoing outreach and engagement work of social justice service providers so they can liaison into identified vulnerable communities experiencing COVID-19 related health disparities. UVM extension bridges to health, um, 94,000, collaborating with local healthcare entities to explore and where possible facilitate increased access to flu vaccines across Vermont and collaborating with local healthcare entities to support testing of farm workers arriving to work in Vermont. And the Vermont Disabilities, uh, Developmental Disabilities Council, 28,000, addressing social isolation and increased access to appropriate PPE and health information for Vermonters with developmental disabilities. Providing 2,500 kits that contain masks, hand sanitizer, plain language COVID information, and plain language flyer about the flu vaccine and how to access it. There's a little bit more um, that I wanna share that just came in separately on a, uh, on a message that is not on this slide. So let me get that for you. In addition to the CRF funding, and all of this adds up to 1.1 million, we have these agreements out of another grant, which is our CDC money, 100,000 to Africans uh, living uh, in Vermont, AALV, um, Association of Africans Living in Vermont, 100,000 to USCRI, um, and that was the refugee that, that used to be called the Refugee uh, Resettlement, uh, 66,000 to Vermont Performing Arts League, 66,000 to the Multilingual Task Force, and 229,000 to Spectrum, which is the fiscal sponsor for the LEND Cultural Brokers Program. So that total is 661,000. Um, so in total, a million and a half dollars have gone out to community-based agencies in the past year or less, actually, probably the past, um, I had said 14 months, but actually that money came in and took a while to get out. It came in late. So probably the past eight months or so. Okay, Representative Donna, he has a question. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I guess I'm a, a little bit interested in a little bit more um, on how the grantees and amounts were selected. I don't remember quite frankly, the exact language that ended up in our uh, bill last fall because the Senate changed it. Um, but 
it's actually not listed on your list, but I had spoken with um, Sarah Chesborough and uh, the only grant that was targeted for psychiatric survivors was for $15,000. They presented a proposal for $72,000, but 15,000 was the only thing that went out for um, psychiatric survivors. And I noticed a lot of the other grants were to were not to um, member of the affected community led uh, programs, which had been one interest of ours and which um, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors is the only uh, statewide organization that does that. So just looking at the other grants, the amounts involved and who was targeted, um, that certainly raises a question for me. Yeah, did you wanna understand how we did this? Is that what you're asking, kind of the process? Well, yes, the process and how we ended up with a, a result that seems um, to be a real disparity compared to what the legislature requested and, uh, and the list of grants that I see. Uh, and obviously I don't know about other requests and so forth. I happen to be familiar with this one because I work there. <laughs> Yeah, so we um, we put the information out widely that the funds were available. We attached the legislative language so they understood what it was for with the focus definitely on the COVID-19 aspect, right? The mitigation, prevention, support of um, that work. And, um, and then uh, basically bids came in. Um, when I say bids, these were, these were proposals. Um, we did not require them to be very lengthy or very complicated. We gave a pretty simple outline and then um, a team reviewed them um, and, and made selections based on the funds available. So we did try to give funding to everyone who applied, who was able to speak to the connection back to COVID-19 because we do need that connection back um, because that is attached to, uh, to the federal funds. Um, but in, in other cases, like in the case of your organization, some organizations put in for funding that was much greater than we um, provided based on the balance of what we had and where we felt the impact was most significant. And we looked at the data to see which groups were at highest risk based on our infection rates and we made decisions as best we could um, balancing all of those pieces. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the get best response you can give at this point. It, it, when you look at the overall list, it certainly does not seem to reflect um, the legislative um, priorities and directives, so. So can I ask a separate question then, Representative Page? Um, there, there are, num as I understand it, there are a number of, there were several grants listed to United Way, uh, which, uh, which I understood their directive was to pass it through to local organizations within their within their areas. Um, do we have a, an accounting of what they where they subgranted the monies to? I will have to get that for you. What I have right now are the grants that we put out. I don't have the list of subgrants here, but I can get back to you. Let me just note that yeah, and I see. That. Because I, I remember particularly for Wind, the Wyndham County United Way, the question was, because again, one of our interests was trying to get monies to organizations which actually were for individuals affected who were run by or impact or affiliated directly with those impacted communities. That was a priority. And United Ways yeah. obviously are not that, but, but, they, but I was told and I understood that they became the avenue because they were more familiar with being able to move these monies into organizations either led by or clearly affiliated with affected communities. So it'd be very useful for us to understand what happened with those, those grants in particular. Sure. Uh, uh, Representative Page. Y yes, um, to follow up with, uh, with Chair Lippert, the money is going to say like the United Way. Uh, how much are their administrative costs out of out of the 1.5 million that you spent to these various communities? How much are they spending on on administrating uh, these funds? So how much actually is actually going to these communities to do the good work that 
that we would like to intend to do. Yeah, so when we put money to the organization, are you asking, for example, when we put it to Outright Vermont, how much they retained to administer the program that they were doing? Is that your question? Uh, are you yes, asking or, or United stage? Way, that sort of thing, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it differed for different organizations. We did allow for staff costs, clearly. Um, and I don't know, I would have to look, differing organizations may have had different amounts um, under the broader category of admin, but we recognize you do have to administer and staff a program, right. although uh -huh. staffing usually falls under direct costs. So I'll check in and see uh, what so, uh, the general range of admin percentages were. So actually it would be less than 1.5 million, I guess. It'd be interesting to know how much actually did go to those communities to do the good work that we intend to do. Yeah, 1.5 million did go out of our department into the organizations that work directly with these communities and or are run by these communities. Uh, and that was really our goal as well. And so the money in our, in, in our assessment really did get to the communities that needed it. But in, in developing programming, it does cost a little bit to actually implement. Um, for example, AALV, that is an organization that represents the people um, that they serve and are, are made up of those people. The multilingual task force is another one. Um, Outright Vermont is another. So uh, in, from what our assessment was of the organizations that were applying, they were organizations that worked with and in many cases were made up of the, uh, the communities that they represent. But I'll check in on any administrative costs and just see, um, but our expectation is that there would need to be some administrative costs for an organization to be able to report back to us to be able to spend effectively, they do need to spend a little on administration because we do need that accountability. Great. Uh, Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanna know what pot of money this 1.5 million comes from. Is this federal money, uh, CARES yes. Act? So it's all federal. Yes, CRF was some of it, the Corona Relief Fund, and then some of it was an ELC grant, which is um, a grant that we get for enhanced laboratory capacity, but it was uniquely expanded in order to address health disparities as well and around COVID-19 specifically. So the CDC released a large grant and is releasing now part two of that, which is enhanced lab capacity, but uniquely for COVID-19 with direction to us to address um, health equity and to get money out in this way um, in order to ensure, for example, uptake of vaccine, ensure testing, ensure that um, contact tracing is effective in these communities and that these communities are able to um, get the education, get the access that they need. Uh, it does in some cases allow us to address equity more broadly as well. Um, it gives us a little bit of wiggle room. So it was both CRF and um, enhanced lab capacity fund. What do these groups have to show you in order to get money? What do they have to prove to you to get a pot of money from you? They submit a proposal and they have to show what they're gonna do with the money um, and what outcomes they expect to get. And this is all about COVID relief. It went to food and necessities, I hope, right? That's what no, we're not all food, Not all food necessities. No, it was about COVID relief broadly, but it was also about health equity. So as I mentioned, some of the activities, some of it was around training and cultural competency so that when people go into communities, they're doing it in a way that makes sense for that community. Some of it was around ensuring uh, less isolation and more social connection, so mental health aspects. So some of it was basic supplies, but a lot of it was other types of activities to address unique needs of these communities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So can you, can you again, can you, um, it's, it's been some time since we uh, finalized the CRF dollars, but as, I, as I'm recalling it, help me, help me others if, if I am got this wrong, but somehow I remember it ended up being $750,000 of CRF dollars, or was it half a million? I'm trying to, I'm trying to in my head, uh, reconcile the numbers uh, between the special grant that you, that the health department received, where we were, I think we initially had, the house had advocated for a million dollars. Uh, and we were at the time, I believe, told that half a million dollars was available through that special grant from the health department. Representative Donahue, can you help me with that? 
if you remember. It, there, there were two. There, there was the people. early bill and the later and bill. bill. Yeah. And I think the combination of those two bills, just the specific CARES Act appropriation rather than the other money, which didn't come through the legislature, was 1.25 million. The combination right. of- so that's, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to sort out because I think, I think the total dollars appropriated from CRF dollars plus the money from the special grant is a greater amount than what we're seeing accounted for here. Right, this 1.25 being accounted for, I think is specifically the CRF that we appropriated as opposed to the other funds that you're referencing. And which I think Tracy referenced in some things that were from the, um, uh, forgetting the name of the order, and FEMA funds, for example. The yeah, there were additional, there were some additional emergency funds as well. But what I can do is go back to our business office and see uh, the breakdown and get that back to you. Yeah, I know that great. some of it came from what you uh, appropriated. Some of it comes from our ELC. And then there were a couple of other pots, including emergency funding out of FEMA. So we've been taking different pieces in order to right. enhance this equity work. Right, right. Um, do you, so you mentioned the, uh, say again the the special grant the, there was a large special grant that uh, had to do with I mean it had a name that didn't seem to describe yeah it's it's, it's it our really ELC was. grant and I'll get ELC, you the full you. proper Thank name you. yeah it's it's our enhanced it's our enhanced lab and surveillance capacity right. grant basically it's a core grant that the departments always get and every department in the country got a very big um, enhancement of that to actually do testing and vaccination and to do all of the laboratory and epidemiology pieces associated with that. So that's another grant that comes in. It's yeah. focused a lot on data reporting systems, but it allows for um, health equity work as well. And so we used some of that grant to enhance the health equity work as well. Yeah, it'd be helpful for, an, for us to understand what portion of that was used and how it was used. Because when we, when we negotiated, frankly, with the Senate, uh, it was in the first round, uh, we were assured from the Department of Health that I believe a large portion, as I recall, $500,000 of that grant was available for the types of projects and outreach that the House and the Senate both felt were important in terms of direct outreach for health disparities. So, it, it, you know, a lot was going on. We were doing a lot over a short period of time. Uh, it would be helpful for us to just try to understand uh, what did happen. So. Yeah, is your concern redundancy that that we had a grant, but you also allocated funds as well? well? My, 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 my question really is, did the full amount that we anticipated being appropriated or being granted out, did it actually, was it granted to community groups? Is that yeah, I believe, I believe it was. We, we pushed hard. I mean, we were shaking the trees. It's a lot of money for smaller organizations to absorb. No, that um, I understand, yeah. Yeah, um, but we pushed hard to get it out. Um, you know, um, we also obviously want organizations to take it who can actually manage it. Um, and so we, you know, we had to work through that. Like, are you able to spend down in this way? But I right. think we did. I, I believe I was in meetings where we were checking on that, um, but I'll double check and make sure well, we got right yeah. up to that place. Okay. Well, I do recall uh, <clears throat> having some conversations about those issues subsequent to the uh, appropriations being made. Yeah. So I have a, a, a Another another related question is that, of course, a lot of this at the time was operating under a December 30th, uh, 2020 deadline for uh, actual having to use or encumber the money appropriately in order to not have it clawed back. And with the, um, do you know if any of the, if these groups were, if they were not able to uh, identify ways that they would, as, as December 30th approached, if they had not been able to document the use of the dollars, were they, with the extension that was given by the subsequent federal law, were those organizations uh, given the ability to continue to expend those funds as they had indicated beyond the December 30th deadline? I checked in a couple of weeks ago about this, but I will, I'll, I'll firm it up. And it's my understanding that they were actually able to spend it down. We had been monitoring and working with them closely and most of them spent the full amount by December 30th. 
but okay. I'll double check and make sure that that's completely accurate for the whole group. But um, I assumed also, like we all did, that there would be a big amount of unspent because it is a large amount to go into small organizations. But we pushed it and um, worked with them a lot early in the beginning. And they got, you know, and, and they were also quite aggressive about their spending and their plans. And so I believe the vast majority was um, committed and spent by December 30th. And I'm assuming, and of course, that there would be a follow-up report we expected from each of the grantees yes. to the Department yes. of Health. Yep. Is, the, is there a period of time in which those follow-up reports are expected? They, they are usually due at the end of the month after the budget period. So I believe they'd be due at the end of January, but I'll check in and we can get that report to you. Okay, great. I don't know if you wanted me to talk about the ongoing work for VAX, and I'm sorry, I, I framed around that because that was the first request that came in and it was a little less clear. Um, and my apologies I for think, that. I think there was some miscommunication. We, we were interested in both issues and it was later I understood that there had been a miscommunication okay. about what we what our interests are. We, we, I believe, I mean, we are interested also in the vaccine outreach to uh, communities uh, marginalized communities and high risk communities as well. Um, yeah. Maybe if there's more that you have can help mm -hmm. us understand, because one of the questions I because the question has been posed to me. Uh, now that the, the vaccine rollout has become clearer. Yeah. Uh, in Vermont, and perhaps you can clarify or are you in a position to clarify for us the general overview, which I understood yes. was healthcare workers, trot priority. Uh, and I believe, are we at the point where healthcare workers have, how, how far along are we in terms of reaching healthcare workers? And then, and then there was a lot of discussion about high risk health uh, with people with underlying health concerns. But I believe that that shifted. Is yeah, that I can correct? talk you through that. Yeah. Uh, so one- It's important to understand that we're now where we are, but I, I don't want to lose sight of, because then the question can, has come, what about outreach to the BIPOC community who obviously yeah. was hugely impacted, disproportionately impacted, and how right. does that fit within the, the health department's vaccine rollout plan currently? I can describe that. Should I do that now? I, I'd appreciate if you would. Okay, yeah. So the uh, implementation plan around priority populations, um, we at CDC first started talking about group 1A, 1B, et cetera. And at the beginning, we were thinking in line with CDC around that. Um, and then as we looked at our so own data. The, 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 there's a request and I, I agree with it. Can we take the slides down so we can actually see each other on the screen at this okay, point? Yeah. Thank you, there appreciate it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, as we looked at our data, we shifted our priorities a little bit based on our data. At the time that the vaccine was arriving, you know that we were having um, some significant outbreaks in the long-term care facilities um, and we were having increased deaths and it really caused us to look carefully at what our mortality data was and our mortality day sh data showed that hands down the biggest risk was being um, an elderly Vermonter. Um, we saw mortality of 90% um, in the 75 plus uh, population. Uh, no, 90% in the 65 plus population. And I think 80% of the mortality was 70 plus. So we, we definitely saw where the risk was. Um, and so after 1A, which was healthcare workers and residents and staff in long-term care facilities, we said then we would move to not a 1B, not essential workers, not frontline. We would move right into what we call phase two, which is the age categories. Um, and so the age categories, which we're in now, are 75 plus, and then we'll move to 70 plus, and then 65 plus. In the meantime, that group 1A will remain open. Um, so it won't close. Those are healthcare workers. Some of them might be hesitant and might come on a little bit later. A hospital could hire a new nurse. So 1A just remains open. But yes, most hospitals have done the vast majority of 1A. And so you'll see overlapping phases. So next week, hospitals will become our partners for the 75 plus. But in the meantime, they're completing any 1A and then that'll just remain open. You know, there'll be a trickle. Um, they also started on 75 plus 
in their inpatient and outpatient because for some of them who were finished 1A early rather than waste vaccine, we kept them moving. So they were doing some 75 plus in, inpatient, outpatient. Um, now, once we get through the age groups and each group remains open. So just like 1A remains open, 75 plus remains open. So when we move to 70, if you're 76, you can still get your vaccine, you know? So, and the, the other reason we're doing these smaller age groupings is that we want to be able to make sure that we actually have enough appointments for everyone every time we open it. So in other states, you're seeing waiting lists and confusion. In our state, when we opened up on Monday, we literally had enough appointments in the system for everyone in Vermont, 75 plus who wants the vaccine, which is amazing. Um, and it really decreases the chaos. When we open for 70 plus, we're hoping for the same kind of thing having enough appointments in there so that people aren't scrambling and wondering, but they can actually get their appointment when they call in. Now, once we get out of those three age groupings, 75, 70, and 65, we're gonna to move to the chronic conditions phase. And the chronic conditions are those largely defined by the CDC. Um, we tweaked it a little bit. Um, for example, CDC put in the, the group of smokers that makes the group so large that it doesn't become a manageable group. So we'll probably drop that. Um, but mostly it's the conditions identified by CDC. And when we say high risk conditions, we don't mean conditions that make you really sick because lots of conditions do that. What we mean are, uh, pardon me, what we mean are conditions that if you were to contract COVID-19, those underlying conditions would make your outcomes much worse. So there's a selected group. At the same time we open chronic conditions, that's when we also say BIPOC, not a chronic condition, but a high risk condition, a high risk social vulnerability will also be in that grouping. So right now, if you're a person of color and you're 75 plus, 70 plus, 65 plus, of course you're in. But also when we get to the chronic conditions phase, our hope is that any age in that BIPOC community, because we know the infection rate is much higher and they're at different risk, will also be included. We haven't figured out all the logistics on that, but our plan is that by the end of the chronic conditions phase, we've also done the majority of BIPOC who would be willing to be vaccinated. So that's generally what the phases look like. And I'm gonna pause and then I can talk about how we've done unique outreach right now with BIPOC and some of the things we're doing right now with the BIPOC communities to ensure that equity. Okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm just gonna take the uh, my position as chair and say that, uh, frankly, I've repeated numbers of places that I actually have appreciated Vermont's approach uh, because when you see the chaos in many other states yeah. and the raised expectations that cannot possibly be met with the limited supply of vaccine that's available right now, uh, it's, it's, it, it, I've appreciated the decision to prioritize uh, those at highest risk of, of death and then of uh, infection. Um, so I think, I, I think there's many of us who appreciate that. At the same time, uh, we as legislators have been being uh, approached by various mm -hmm. constituents and constituent groups saying, uh, for instance, uh, the, the, I think one of the most uh, vocal groups right now are teachers saying, we are in schools. Uh, we are. We're feeling uh, left out of this process. Most of us are not going to be in that high rate, high age range. When do we get the vaccine, and why are we not being prioritized? Uh, I, I would just like to give you and the Department of Health a chance to articulate. Uh, I think you've articulated broadly, but to articulate that and uh, particular issue. Yeah, you know, the governor still has not landed on whether or not we're going to be doing uh, groups of workers in that way. Um, right now, our focus is the elderly. And as you said, we really look at mortality and morbidity, not just infection. Um, so teachers, for example, don't appear to have higher risk than actually anyone else in Vermont. Um, when we look at surveillance testing that we've been doing, the rates are just very low um, and we're surveilling really, you know, the teachers um, on a weekly basis in a rotating fashion. And the rate of positivity coming back for teachers is very, very low. Um, I think we've had, uh, I, I can't remember the, I think 
39 or 40 teachers positive out of 23,000 tests. So it's a very, very low rate. And, um, and as you know, generally the age grouping doesn't put them at high risk for the mortality morbidity. Not saying it can't happen because of course it's not as mathematical as that. Um, but that's not why we're not including teachers right now. It's not because they're not getting infected. It really is about stopping people from dying. Um, and since we started vaccinating, we're already seeing deaths go down in long-term care facilities. It's literally about stopping that from happening. But as we move through the chronic uh, disease group, um, I think the governor you know, may consider um, other groupings, but there, we haven't landed on what the process will be beyond the chronic disease group. By then we will have reached a lot of Vermonters. We will, we will have reached by the end of the chronic conditions group, hundreds of thousands of Vermonters. So it will be a smaller group by then. And I don't know yet what the governor's thinking, but we are giving him the science and we're trying to inform this as best we can about reducing risk. Another group that I've heard from, I think others have as well is uh, family saying, I have a family member who is at high risk for because of the under, I mean, very high risk because of the underlying medical condition. They may be immunosuppressed. They may have, uh, and they're, but their age is never, they're never gonna get within any of the top three age bands. Uh, why do they have to wait? They have to wait because we're looking at a population level and our numbers tell us that the people who are most likely to die are 65 plus regardless of underlying condition. Once we get 65 plus done, then once we move to that other group, the data tells us that's the second most likely group. And so we're not doing exceptions. Um, we have said no across the board. We've said it kindly and compassionately, but once we go down the road of exceptions, it becomes incredibly challenging to say yes to one and no to another because everybody has a very compelling case. We're getting calls, we're getting files from doctors, we're getting lawyers' letters that are explaining conditions to us on a daily basis. Right. And uh, we really just have to stick with the science. If this was uh, a very small community um, and 660,000 feels small, but it's not that small, we could maybe tailor, but we're a state and we have to go by population. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I realize that we may wanna come back to this at another time as well, given the time limitations we have this morning and all of what we're trying to cover. I'm going to turn to uh, Representative Donahue and then Representative Peterson. And I'm- uh, I Very, we... very quick. Uh, I, I appreciated your verbal description of uh, how the priority system is working in terms of uh, the BIPOC community. And it sounds very responsive, but it would be great to have that in a little written summary or bullet points um, to share for people who have been asking about that. Yeah, it's actually in the slide deck as well, once uh, in, in later slides that describes the strategy too. Okay, and, and that's not the outreach strategy, but uh, in terms of the description you gave about how they fit into the... Yeah, I believe so. I believe that, that's bullet. in the slides, okay. Yeah, I believe there's a bullet that explains by the end of the chronic condition phase, our, our expectation is also to have completed BIPOC. Yeah. So, so if you, um, those slides are not on our website yet. So thank you. Okay. If you can forward them as well. Thank you. Yeah. I, it's the slide deck that I just forwarded to Colleen and my apologies for not affording it earlier. Thank you. Okay. Represent Peterson, then represent Chino. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just so I'm, I'm clear here. So we know the, uh, people in uh, uh, nursing facilities and, and those that are high risk go first, then 75 and above, 70 and, and above, and then folks of, with high risk conditions. 65 and above. Oh, you're going down to 65 and above, and yes. then people Sorry. of high risk conditions. Okay. Yes. What, what makes, what are the factors that make the BIPOC community more susceptible to the disease? I'm just curious. That's a great question. Yeah, there is a great question. There are some long-term factors and there are some short-term factors. The long-term factors are the broader kind of systemic racism and institutional racism that puts people of color at, at more risk generally. Um, and so just a, a longer term um, institutional, uh, for example, people of color um, statistically simply have less access to care. They tend to live in places where care is less likely they tend to live in places where the environment is less healthy. They tend to have incomes that are lower than others. So, so there's those bigger systems, but then there's more proximal reasons. Um, things like 
for COVID, for example, if you are an essential worker that works in a job facing the public, you have higher risk for infection. If you are a person of color, you're much more likely to have a job like that. Um, for people with limited English proficiency, so coming from other countries here, it's likely more difficult for you to have understood and heard all the messaging, so you're at higher risk there. Culturally, you may have some cultural practices, and because you come over and you surround yourself maybe with families from your culture, there might be cultural practices that are not as safe as other practices, so you may be doing more large gatherings or have other cultural practices that might be more risky, that's putting you at higher risk. And then health-wise, people of color have higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of emphysema. Um, our, our First Nations people, our indigenous Abenaki, have much higher rates of asthma, as an example, so um, and emphysema. So there are short-term health reasons, and then those are underlaid by the longer-term systemic issues in our country that are a little less visible, but when you look into it, you realize, oh, that policy uniquely affects this group. It doesn't look like it on the surface, but when you dig in, you realize this group continually gets these, these hits in all kinds of policies that we have that collectively put them at a higher risk. So in Vermont, um, our community of color, I said three times, it's probably actually four or five times the infection rate, even though they're a very small part of our population. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Rip said Gina. Thanks. I'm sorry if we interrupted your slide because I heard you refer to some later slides and I was waiting. I had questions earlier, but I was waiting. And now that there's only a few minutes left, I'm asking now. So I'm sorry if we yeah. derailed the things. Um, That's okay. Yeah. But I, and I noticed earlier that we have made a lot of investments in a wide variety of programs uh, that address health and wellness in ways that go beyond mainstream healthcare. And I also appreciated that we're trying to support cultural competency in the healthcare system. And I'm curious, looking forward, what further investments do you anticipate being needed in the next year, not only to address the pandemic, but to support the work after the pandemic? Because now that we're talking about it, obviously more needs to be done. So I'm curious if you have any you know, preliminary ideas around what, where we should be heading. Can, can, yeah, I, I mean can, I, can I step in here and say, I really appreciate your question, Representative China. And given our time, uh, I'll give uh, Tracy a chance to do any high, high level, but this is an area that we will come back to. We will want to have Tracy or others from the Department of Health come and talk to us at much greater length. So just to identify that. Yeah, I'll give you just a couple of sentences. We're recognizing the same thing. Um, we already knew this, this wasn't news to us. COVID-19 just put a spotlight on these disparities. Um, and Part of the investment is a greater investment internally at the department to have a stronger health equity presence so that we're tracking it and putting more investment in it. And then part of it is to more systemically get money out to the communities so that these partnerships don't just need to be revitalized every time there's an epidemic, but that it's ongoing. So I would say those are two strategies, one internal capacity building and two getting money out to the community, to vulnerable communities and having an ongoing partnership because it's these chronic diseases underneath. That's the second part, right? So it's COVID and then the chronic diseases underneath. We could get a handle on that. And then the deeper stuff, of course, which feeds it all, um, which isn't just a Department of Health job, but, but everyone's, that's the way long-term we address this. So we have to figure out how to continue to invest in this way. And I'm hoping the federal government is seeing that. Um, Biden's recent executive orders on health equity hopefully signal more funding for this type of work. Okay. Uh, I see Representative Goldman has a question. I'm going to ask if you can state the question and maybe it's something we can come back to. But uh, again, we're operating under a more constrained time frame this morning, but we will have more time to look at this together. Yeah, I'm happy to state, yeah, I'm happy to state my question. Um, we're looking at an audio only reimbursement bill and I'm wondering if you or the Department of Health have an opinion about this population and looking at um, that kind of modality in supporting them. And you may not know that answer, but I'm curious of that intersectionality. Yeah, and I'm sorry, is audio only, is that um, limited uh, hearing? No. no, it's talking about use access to healthcare by telephone only without video and get oh, the sorry. questions about reimbursement. 
you know, I thought it was a new description for a group and I'm like way out of it. Sorry. Okay. Um, so telehealth and reimbursement, I can't speak to that right now. I know that we're finding telehealth incredibly valuable, but I can't speak to um, that particular uh, piece of legislation or is it a bill? So I'm, we're not. We're, we're working on that in committee uh, again this okay. afternoon. So can I, Representative Goldman, can I, your question I think is an appropriate, is, is obviously is a good question. Uh, can you articulate that in a in an email to uh, sec, uh, Deputy Secretary, Deputy Commissioner Dolan and copy it to the committee? And maybe we can work that into our deliberations around telehealth, which we're in the midst of as well. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask about whether the Department of Health has a position. Okay. Yeah, and Representative maybe they Lippert, have... Yes. Representative Lippert, may I uh, add just, just two small points on what we're doing around Please. vaccine besides? So on the day we opened, we highlighted particularly in the limited ang English community um, and got them in early in terms of setting up accounts because we knew it would take longer for them to sign up. So we got good uptake there in the limited English community. Um, and now as we move through 75 plus, et cetera, um, recognizing there are some areas that still might be hesitant. There's a lot of vaccine hesitancy and mistrust, particularly among our community of color. We may go in and do some specialized clinics um, maybe even at some multi-generational households to try to pick up those higher risk individuals. So we are doing some tailored outreach and work as well as funding communities to do a lot more education. They're uh, developing uh, multilingual videos around vaccine safety. They're filming themselves getting vaccinated and spreading that all around. So we're funding all of that to really decrease the vaccine hesitancy so that we can get this group more comfortable with getting vaccinated. Great. Well, again, we're, we're, we've covered a lot in a short period of time, but there's a lot more. We appreciate your follow-up on the CRF dollars and the special grant dollars, so we can understand that better, uh, particularly if we, if and as we're in the position to appropriate additional dollars so that we can be sure that we're on the same page in terms of targeting some of those dollars. Um, and we will be coming back to the issue of health disparities uh, COVID related and non-COVID related, uh, particularly for the BIPOC community, but others as well. And uh, we'll be scheduling that at another point in time. Uh, I, I want to all just name one other thing that before we finish, because we're going to, we really do need to stop, unfortunately. Uh, and that is some conversation about uh, vaccine hesitancy generally. And uh, I mean, that's a nice phrase to put it. I mean, I think it's a kind of a, become a ben more benign way of describing uh, some, some Vermonters who actually want no part of the vaccination process. Uh, and others who are hesitant. But but I think there are also, uh, I, I want us to make sure that we have an understanding of how to access and uh, questions or how, how to resolve questions or give information to constituents about the vaccination process, vaccination safety, et cetera. The irony is there are more Vermonters demanding access more quickly rather than uh, it seems than and that, and that for those who uh, are, wanting to reach herd immunity, et cetera, that's a, it's a good sign. But we'll, and just we'll, a, quick, a quick update on that. We are reaching higher levels than expected nationally. So nationally, only about 40 or 50% of people working in long-term care facilities have been vaccinated. Here at 60%, um, long-term care facility residents were at 90%, that's higher nationally. Um, even our healthcare workers in hospitals were at 80 to 90%, it's 70% nationally. So luckily, even though we have a vaccine hesitant state around children's vaccine and others, for some reason, and I think it might be around just the, the tons of transparency and communication we've had, we are actually getting higher uptake rates, it appears, than many other parts of the country, which is good news. So maybe I'll do, we'll just end with, again, uh, accolades to the Department of Health for working based on science with our uh, with Governor Scott and his administration, I think there's many of us who uh, feel a deep level of appreciation for what has been able to have happen in terms of keeping Vermonters safe during the COVID pandemic. Uh, even though it's we're, we can we recognize we're in, we continue to be in a very very difficult uh, situation. This is not resolved, but um, so thank you for being with us this morning, and we will continue to uh, invite you back. You or other yeah. colleagues in the Department of Health. So with that, I'm going to uh, Thank you. take us off of live.